Welcome to episode number eight of the Career Breakthrough Series. I'm your host, Paul Ames, and if you guys are tuning in on iTunes, don't forget to subscribe or leave us a review so that we know that you guys are getting amazing value from our series we're delivering. Guys, on the show today, we've got an incredible guest, Nicholas Law. Nicholas is the founder of the Rockport Institute. He's been commended by two US presidents for the work that he's delivered. He's helped over 16,000 individuals with their career, and he's also created two and are the author of two amazing books. One of them is The Pathfinder. This Pathfinder book I personally have bought and gone through a lot in my career and in my business, and it delivers amazing value. This is an incredible value-packed interview with Nick, and I can't wait to get you guys started. So let's go inside. Guys, welcome to episode number eight of the Career Breakthrough Series. I'm your host, Paul Ames, and on the show today, we've got someone who's inspired me so much with my business, Nicholas Law. Now, Nick is a, uh, an author of two incredible books, one which has really helped me uh, so much with my career and especially with my business and my clients, and also he's the founder of the Rockport Institute, which has helped over 10,000 individuals with their career. He's also been commended by two US presidents. What an absolutely incredible person Nick is, and he's such an inspiration to me and my journey. So, Nick, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, if you could just give the audience a bit of background on, on your history growing up, uh, where you're from, and basically what things were like for you. Well, uh, I, was, I was born a long time ago, uh, right after... N- right after the Normandy invasion. And my dad was the coordinator of the Manhattan Project. And we lived in a secret city in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There was a secret that had 100,000 people living there and the secret never got out. These days, the secret would last, you know, maybe five minutes. Yeah. You know, but in those days, <laughs> they kept the secret. And um, so I... Uh, I don't know. I was always interested in doing something that made a difference in people's lives. And uh, I managed to spend a lot of my college time in, in uh, New York City and Greenwich Village in the early to mid 60s. So I was part of the big rock and roll revolution. And some of my friends became, you know, huge stars, people that played it. Woodstock, people who were the big songwriters of their times. But I never felt like I found my own path. Um, that that um, I could see that all these people were amazingly talented, and I, I just didn't have those talents. So I was okay, but not great. Yeah. Um <clears throat> And then I went through a series of jobs. I ran people's companies and did all sorts of things. But after a number of years, I was living on the coast of Maine, right on the beautiful coast with lobster boats going out and was a very artistic, sophisticated area. And I made a promise to myself that I was going to love what I did with my life. Do you have a friend there? There's a noise. What? Uh, those are like huge Australian birds flying around. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting in a sitting in a park, so the birds are going through. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. My didgeridoo itches. I'll. Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> and um, uh, I uh, and then so I made friends with this amazing man. We were in the same little boat club, Buckminster Fuller, who was one of the greatest architects and he was probably the greatest futurist of the 20th century. So I was lucky to be with this amazingly brilliant person could help me through designing what I was going to do in my life. So I started, and this is what I'm saying here. This isn't about me. I'm telling a story about me, but this is really about how one best goes about just pick, picking a career that fits. So I started looking at different elements, like I get bored really easily. I had to do something where there, were, there was a lot of change and new projects, and I have a particular way of solving problems that I'm good at. And I decided, so I was building these definite components. And so then I decided it would be something that 
would help thousands and thousands of people in a practical way. And I realized that I'm not really a competitive person. So I didn't want to be in a field like where a bunch of scientists are all fighting and battling, you know, to do all that stuff. I wanted to pick an area where it was about people's well-being, but where the people who did it were well-meaning, but extremely misguided. And that was career guidance. So in those days, there was just primitive, you know, you'd come in and you'd take an interest test and a personality test, you'd get a list. Yeah. So um, when I decided what I was going to do, after that, I started to design things. And I created the field of career coaching, which is, yeah, a counselor is like an expert. That's a lawyer is a, you know, as a counselor, an expert on something or other. I thought that it would work much better if two people work together, client and coach. Definitely. And the, the model, and that, this was like nine years before the whole coaching revolution started. So oh, wow. we were one of the first, this was 1980, 81, and the whole coaching thing started in 1990. So, you know, we were pioneers in that, and I created this whole idea of, Somebody, you know, a person working with a coach who's not necessarily an expert, they're a person who, you know, is able to scope out what you're like and ask the best questions and design a process that leads you to picking a career that's a great fit. So I did that 30 something years ago. Wow. And I still love what I'm doing. I founded Rockport Institute. And we've worked with more than 16,000 oh, wow. clients. But it's the thing, what I designed was a way to have a constant flow of new problems that were fun. Exactly. Wow. Maybe, you know, I had to make up a field to do it, but sometimes it takes that. And what really matters is how committed one is to doing something that's a great fit. Exactly. Because your mind is going to tell you you can't do it. That's, that's brilliant, Nick. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to say thank you for creating the career coaching field because it's something that's so beneficial. I think in my own practice, I take more of a, a coaching role rather than yeah. a counseling role because like you, I'm like you, exactly what you said. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I find the same sort of you know, benefits in helping people and I get bored quite quickly. So it's so engaging in this field that we're in. So thanks for that, Nick. Yeah. Well, there has to be something that's alike and people that pick the same thing. I mean, someone that plays jazz saxophone, you know, it's got to be in some ways like other cats that do that too. Yeah. So, exactly. yeah, great. Exactly. So, go ahead. I'm, I'm messing with your timetable. Oh, sure. no, not at all. No, I'm, I'm loving everything you're saying. It's absolutely brilliant and inspiring to, to hear your journey. So, uh, yeah, so just talk us through some of the previous careers that you've done prior to finding what you've done uh, for prior to finding the Rockport Institute and what biggest takeaways and biggest learnings you got from those. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I was everything from a CEO of smaller companies, under 500 people companies. I was a researcher in psychology I was plant manager of a company that just made, you know, folding cardboard boxes. I, I was a rock and roll lead singer in the in Alaska. Oh wow! Uh, I was um, I was when I was in college. I worked for a big private detective agency nice. as an operative. And, you know, earlier than that, I did things like, well, my first, you know, I learned a lot from every job. So my first job was they in a, a boy's magazine, I saw this ad for the cheerful card company. You sent away, they'd send you all these greeting cards, and you'd have to take them around and sell them to the people in the neighborhood, or you had to pay for them. Yep. <laughs> tell you at first, you know. So... Uh, I went out once, and I, I, I think I knocked on two people's. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And so I learned a lot from that. I learned I'm not a sales guy. Yep. Uh, 
Plus, I have to really be invested in something. These cards were really bad. <laughs> Imagine what cards were like in the 50s, and then think what were really bad cards like in the 50s. They oh, yeah. So, you know, I learned things even at 10 that, you know, I had to be proud of what it was, and it had to be something that I would personally stand for. So that, I mean, what I'm really saying is when you want to pick a career that fits, you become a detective. Yep. You're in a project, just like a detective is trying to solve a crime, you're looking for clues about what's going to fit you. And the, most of those clues, at least at first, are about you. What do you like? What do you care about? What are you really good at? What comes to you easily and naturally that, you know, time just passes and you're not thinking about it. It's just, uh, you're just in a flow state. And, and of course, you have to think about what's practical, too. And But you want to start out with um, kind of playing detective with yourself. Yep. I think that's a brilliant analogy and brilliant. I love the way that you, through, like obviously reading your book, it was the best, honestly, the best career development book I've ever read or resource I've ever read. And it's such a straightforward but like in-depth way of going through and finding a career you love. And from working through it as well myself, I just went, wow, this just clarifies everything that I'm in the right path of helping people as a career counselor yeah. and career coach. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely brilliant, Nick. Well, thank you very much. And I think one of the things that we uncovered or discovered or happened upon, or I don't even remember how it happened, but uh, – the power of certainty. So saying you're sure about important elements, like I'm going to be, it's going to be like this for me in the future. You know, and most of the time when people like that, they're not really creating a new future. It's kind of like you're on a train and I don't know, you're not happy with the way things are going. So you go to a different car on the train or you go to a different seat, but the train is still going where it's going. Right. Yep. So when you really take a stand, it's going to be this way. When you make a promise to yourself that some element of your work is so important, you're going to claim it. Then you're a guy, you're out in front of that train laying tracks, which is that's you creating your future instead of just, you know, just having the past continue forever. Exactly. That's great advice, guys. Go back and have a listen to what Nick's just told you because that's uh, really solid advice there. Um, so, Nick, uh, I have to ask, uh, so how did you get the two commendations from the two U.S. presidents? How did that come about? That's absolutely incredible. When I read that, I was like, wow, that's, that's an amazing feat and uh, achievement to have, to have got. Well, the first one was because in the 70s, I was interested in what they now call the green revolution. I was an organic farmer. I was the vice president of a really big and powerful regional organic farming and gardening organization, even though nobody, they, they thought we were all crazy. Of course, at the time there wasn't any organic anything. Uh, and, and I, and I ran a company that did energy conservation and some solar design and stuff like that. And one project that I did got, you know, a commendation letter from President Carter for that field. So we don't say we got two commendations. We say our staff got two. Yep. So that's like marketing bullshit in a way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the second one was from Bill Clinton, and that was for our work and our programs. And I got that really because, you know, we live close to Washington, D.C. And if you have anything on a shovel and you're shoveling and throwing it away, more stuff falls off near where the shovel is. Exactly. It's like all the Beltway, you know, experts and stuff. So was, I, I don't know. Probably if I lived someplace else, it would have never happened. Wow. That's, yeah, that's incredible, though. And uh, you should be so proud of that still. Yeah, still. Yeah, I mean, he is people he knew, worked with us, did our programs, and it was really successful. And so he, he you know, 
he he did a, a wonderful commendation, which isn't all that common, I guess. Ah, oh, perfect. Um, so Nick, so in your career, what would you say has been the biggest mental roadblocks or mental obstacles that you've had to work through, and how have you worked through them? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I think there's a couple of them. One of them is that we all have our head, our brain is talking all the time, you know? So it's just <laughs> going on. It's with this chatter all the time. And we think we're thinking, but really it's just stuff happening. We're not controlling it. If you were, then you just sit here for a minute and you just say, okay, stop thinking for a minute. <laughs> And then me, it's thinking. It just goes on and on and on. But you're not even doing it. So we have voices in our head that are always telling us to play it safe. Exactly. You know, they're always saying, well, you can't do it for this reason or that reason. Or you have, and you don't have enough education. Or you have too much education. It's the wrong education. You're too young. You're too old. This would be too much of a stretch for you. You have to be practical. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And those things are not just thoughts. They're a mechanism. Like, does it ever get cold there where you live? Um, yeah, not not freezing cold, but some, sometimes it can get down to one. Right? You guys know what a thermostat is, right? Uh, sure do. Just have to check. I mean, it could be so <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know what they are. What's a thermostat? <laughs> it's a, it's like a device that when it, it it's set for a certain thing, yeah. when it goes away from that setting, it creates a reaction. It turns on the furnace or the air conditioner to get it back to equilibrium. Yeah. And that's the way our brains work. So whenever we do something that's outside of the range of what is seems safe, it's going to tell us why it won't work. And we're going to feel fear. We're going to feel uncertainty. We're going to have all these things happen. Those feelings are really just like yeah buts that are keeping, trying to keep everything the same. And that system is, it's on our side. It wants to keep us from danger. But it was designed for you know, somebody, a hunter-gatherer living 20,000 years ago when things just wanted to eat you pretty much. <laughs> I know it's still somewhat the same in Australia. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we've got our fair share of uh, venomous and uh, poisonous things over here, yeah. <laughs> Fox, jellyfish, and all yeah. these poisonous snakes and things like that. <laughs> you know, more than we do. We just have rabid squirrels, you know, around yeah. you. <laughs> so, you know, so the whole system was designed for that time when we, it really was all, every moment was a matter of physical survival. Yep. Now we live in a sophisticated world, but we have, still have these ancient brains that react. It can't tell the difference between, you know, you saying something like, uh, maybe I'll dive off this cliff, you know, and it's going, no, no, you know, with good reason. And you saying, I'm going to create something new in my life. I'm going for having a career that's a much better fit. It's still going to go, no, no. Yep, <laughs> exactly. So that's the biggest thing that I had to deal with. That's perfect. And I, I, I love all of that. That's, uh, that's great. And, uh, I think some of the analogies you use in your book are so good. They really stand out in you. And uh, some of the terms in that, I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool. I've never heard that before. But it, it, it's such a great way of thinking. And, and like you said, you know, we're stuck with this old-fashioned brain that served us back then, but we're not challenging our thoughts now, or challenging these automatic thoughts. So, yeah, that's great advice. Thanks a lot, Nick. But you can always do that in any minute. You can just say, whoa, I, I, that makes sense to me. So I'm not going to put up with having just an okay life. Exactly. You know, I'm going to step in. I'm going to lay some tracks in front of that train instead of just being a passenger. Exactly right. That's perfect. So, Nick, what are some of the biggest things that you're excited about in your business moving forward? Or what's some big projects going on for you over there right now that's got you lit up inside? Well, it's really one, which is... We've never done any marketing. 
We've been around since 1981. And now with the internet and everybody, you know, it's at least here in the U.S., everybody, you're not a person anymore. You're a, what are you? You're a, uh, a product. You're a, what is the word? You're a, uh, uh, not sure. <laughs> oh, it's whatever it is. You're yeah. kind of like a thing to market, you know, you're, and Facebook, that's what people are doing. All the, Facebook stuff is all just, you know, marketing. You're a brand. You're a brand. It's a personal brand. So we never liked that and never did any marketing. But now we're working on a new really beautiful website because ours is 12 years old and is really long in the tooth and ready to get have a good Christian burial in <laughs> website heaven. <laughs> oh perfect that's brilliant and uh i actually like your website i think it's really easy to navigate and uh the work through so yeah it's it's held up for uh 12 years it's still going good well that just proves you're kind of a hippie what can I do? <laughs> probably am deep heart <laughs> uh so nick what would you say obviously my audience is uh like more of a professional market who you know struggle to roll out of bed and they're miserable in their job yeah. um so what would you say would be three to five actionable tips that my audience could take to help either help get them into a career they love or to move forward in their career okay well um let me just talk about the careers that people are already in so people complain all the time so part of, you know, you have things that don't fit about your career, but you also have the fact that you complain all the time. So if you just, just try and experiment, give up complaining for a week completely. You know, you have to catch yourself. It's like somebody quitting smoking. You're going like this. And you go, oh, no. So you have to catch your brain uh, uh, complaining and just stop complaining for a week and see what happens. I'm not saying every, anything's going to be better, but that way you can kind of separate complaining. Everybody complains, right? Who, who doesn't complain? Definitely. I've been complaining about Donald Trump all day. <laughs> and, and so... Uh, they won't even remember who that is by the time people listen. <laughs> us. But, you know, so my brain just, everybody's brain does it. So that's, I think that's a really useful thing. And if you're going to stay in the job you're in, no matter how senior you are, your whole job is just making your boss look good. Yep. That's the whole thing. Those are the two things. But, Probably an awful lot of the time, the job doesn't really fit. So I think the first thing you have to do is really make a decision about whether you're going to do something about it or not. And most people really don't. And that's the truth. And that's perfectly okay that they don't. It's perfectly okay. You don't have to do something that's a great fit. Yep. You don't have to have the individualism or the courage or, you know, get stomped badly enough so you do something about it. It's perfectly okay to have a crappy career. You know, you're successful, you're supporting your 2.2 children and your fleet of dingoes, you know, all of that <laughs> is perfect. you got to support the dingoes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that's fine. So people always think there's something wrong about having your career not fit. But it's a choice you make. And, you, you know, every day you wake up and you go to that job, you're making that choice that this is it. But you're also making a choice to complain about it all the time. So either just do something about it or shut the fuck up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's gold. Uh, you guys, yeah, rewind, uh, rewind and have a listen to that. That's absolutely amazing advice there from Nick. And uh, it's so true. Stop complaining. Take charge of your life and do something about it. That's the biggest thing. I know. Yeah, yeah, as you shut said. up. Yeah, There's exactly. better about taking charge of your life. That's only true if you're interested and committed to do that. Yep. If you're not, 
just quit complaining. Exactly. And just, this is what you picked. It's not that great. But just, you know, quit complaining. This is what you picked. You're committed to this. You know how you know that? Because you go there every morning. That's how you can tell. You can wake up going, where am I? Where am I? You're at this place you picked. Yep, exactly they right. Don't they don't think that. They feel like this has happened to them, that they're the victim of something, circumstance or bad choices or some personal failing. It's not. It's just what they choose. And if you're ready to pick something else, then, you know, start to look at your future. And I think the way to start it is to be able to create possibilities, to be able to look and see what might be possible for you. It's possibilities that always lead. So you don't want to start thinking of all the logical solutions first. You want to think about, well, what, what might I have in my life that I don't now? What is it I'd most want to have if I could? And, you know, kind of begin to invent possibilities. And you can practice in little ways, like with your kids. What's a new possibility I could have with my kids? Well, I could do this with them that I never did before. Or I could do that. Or you, if you're just like a lonely guy out there somewhere, you could just say, well, what could I do? Let me go... You know, I'm going to go meet three people this weekend. That's a possibility. Definitely. So make it into an adventure. Yep. I love that. I love that. <clears throat> that's, that's great advice, Nick. Um, so, Nick, I've got a bit of a random question now to ask. Um, so what would you say would be the core of a happy and healthy life for you, both at work and at home? Uh, well, I think... Uh, the core of a happy, healthy life is a healthy life because if you don't, if you're not healthy, if you're suffering, you're not going to have a happy life. I had a bout of sciatica, leg pain about a month ago. And so I wasn't good for anything. I was just, uh, you know, unhappy, miserable. So there's no way that you don't take care. You have to feed the orchard. You know, like fertilize that orchard, take care of the orchard, and the apples will come. So if you're healthy, then um, I think the next thing is to be true to yourself, to have integrity. And uh, and that doesn't mean on anybody else's terms, you know. you. Uh, I think it's health first and then having integrity – and then not believing everything you think. Yep. You know, just look for what it's like for other people and be a lot more open and listen. Listen more. That's great. That's I, I don't know. I probably if you ask me ten minutes from now, I'd <laughs> be completely different ones. No, I think it's true. They're really crucial elements, definitely. So, Nick, I know you've, had a, oh, you've got a ton of career knowledge and advice in your head, but what would you say would be the best career advice you've received yourself? And, uh, yeah, who was it from and, and what was the advice you've received? Well, it, it was from Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller. And, you know, it was don't compromise. It was, you know, a lot of people say that there's quotes from John Lennon like that. There's quotes from Steve Jobs like that. They just go on and on and on. All these people are saying the same thing. Uh, you're either self-expressed, really self-expressed in your work or not. And so it is just so crucial. And it makes such a difference if you just knew how much happier and more fulfilled you would be, you would do anything. You'd be like a drug addict that would do anything for the drug because feeling fulfilled is the best. It's not necessarily happy because you still are, you're going to go through all these moods. You're going to have good days, bad days, but to be fulfilled in your life and work is the best drug there is. Definitely. That's, that's great yeah. advice you've received there. That's really good. And yeah, yeah, fulfillment is such an incredible thing. As you said, obviously it's still like a roller coaster, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, still incredible getting the high highs and uh, unfortunately the low lows. But uh, 
yeah, low that- love. I mean, you know, if you're fulfilled, you, you have all different kinds of moods. But at the heart of it all, you're just not having a really good day. But if you look at your life, you can say, if somebody asks you if you're fulfilled, that you're down that day, you can look and go, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm just, you know, not my best day. But so happiness is a mood. You know, you can't, seeking a mood is not very smart. Because moods change all the time. Like anybody that's paying attention knows that they're going through all these emotions and moods all the time. And it doesn't have that much to do with you. It's like somebody can go in and go, ah, you. <laughs> you totally change your state and your mood, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, you know, so instead of trying to be happy, probably is wiser to seek fulfillment. So you're fulfilled no matter what's going on. I, I had a friend who, who once said, you know, when I was an unfulfilled guy long ago, I hated doing the dishes. And I just hated it with a passion. Yep. And so, and somebody said, now you're feeling a lot more fulfilled about your life. Now you like doing dishes? And he said, no, no, I still hate doing it. <laughs> but now I don't mind hating doing the dishes. Exactly. Of, I just do the dishes and I'm fulfilled doing them. And I notice I'm feeling like, you know, harsh, I didn't have to do these. Yeah. But it doesn't have the impact. It's not the center of my life. Exactly. That's uh, very, very true. That's great. Um, so, Nick, do you feel like you found your why or your, your purpose in life from what you've been doing over the, the past, was it 30 years, did you say you've been with Rockport? Well, since 1981. Oh, so 35 years, oh yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like you found your, your why, your passions? I, I didn't go to school that day. <laughs> uh, well, it's, see, I think purpose is a strange thing. I think, pe- to me, people don't have a purpose. Yeah. It's like a crazy idea that somewhere up in heaven, there's a bunch of kind of, angels with dusty wings and they're figuring out before your birth what your purpose is you don't have a purpose you have to invent your purpose and what you have to invent it with is what you're good at what you care about you know what has been you know who you are you have to look at who you are what are you designed to do really well and then look and see what, you know, if there's some way you want to make a difference or have some impact or whatever it is. So purpose is something that's declared. It's invented. It doesn't, it's not something to look for because there's nothing there. You have to create it. It's, it's a matter of, of invention. And for people who are, you know, re- very religious, they'll say, you know, uh, they're made in God's image. Well, what is it that God is good at doing? Creating stuff. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so that's like, you know, uh, it's, it, it really works for everybody. You know, you, you, uh, the, the idea of finding your purpose is kind of like the, you know, all the people that are looking for the Holy Grail. Yeah. There wasn't any Holy Grail. You know, if there, if it exists at all, it's just a crappy little tin cup the guy had. You know? Exactly. He didn't have a grail. He's <laughs> like poor people in a primitive desert country, and they're the poorest. It's just something that's the searching for it. People get involved in that endless search, but you want to be a finder more than a searcher. And I think the way to do that is you have to, it's up to you what your life is about. Because it's just going to be about, you know, you on, it's just a mechanical existence centered on having you not be unhappy or keeping everything the same. But if you want to be up to something, you have to create it. You have to create that purpose, that future, that making that vision real. That's perfect. That's that's a really good, really good advice. 
Um, so, Nick, uh, just going to your personal behaviours and habits that you've got, um, so what would you say would be one of your I most successful... Questions about my... No, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, what would you say would be one of your most uh, positive personal habits that you have that contributed to your success? And also, what would be one of the habits that have hindered you or stopped you uh, uh, getting to where you want to be? Oh, man. Well, probably the best habit is that many years ago, I realized that, you know, everybody thinks they're something. I mean, you look in the mirror, there's this person, oh, that's me. It's the same person. You know, if like you looked in the mirror and it was somebody else, you'd be shocked. <laughs> but, so I kind of made up a new part to myself, which is... I am my word. If I make a promise, I'm going to keep that. Not because it's good, not because it's the right thing to do, but because I can be counted on. And, you know, so there's, there's kind of like a certain integrity in that. And so where that showed up in one place was I promised a mentor, it was Buckminster Fuller, that I would spread after developing all this kind of work and so forth, I would spread it around. But I knew that I couldn't write. I, you know, I'd write thank you letters after Christmas and uh, birthday and stuff like, thank you, aunt, something or other for, and well, of course those are impossible to write because what are you going to say? It's all the same <laughs> thing. You know, thanks for the socks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was completely sure that I couldn't write. Yet I made a promise to write a book and have it be a bestseller, have it be a permanent backlist bestseller, and have it do all these things that I didn't think books had done before, one of which was to be like your friend. You'd have a personal relationship with this book, and you would feel kind of like it was your guide, and it was you were intimate with it, and I, I, all these things to me were impossible, but I just promised these things, and then I would just get up every morning and go down, and I would my mind would go crazy. You can't do this. You know, you'll turn it in. They're going to want their money back and everything. So then I would sit down, and I'd say, you just said you're going to do it. So I would sit down and do it yep. just because I said so. So that's probably that's the answer to part of it. Yep. And the biggest problem is... I'm physically lazy, you know. I really just want to have fun. Yep. Like the Cindy Lauper song. <laughs> <laughs> I just want, and so I'm sort of going against this, you know, these streaks in my personality that aren't, you know, there's plenty of room for them. I'm doing it today, other than talking with you. I'm. Yep. Uh, just goofing around. I'm not working much today. So, you know, I'm, but I mean, that's, the, that's something that, uh, you know, this making promises was part of it. Also, I have an absolutely amazing wife who, uh, you know, I can't get away with <laughs> everything <laughs> that I want to. So, you know, that's, it's, that's just luck, I guess. But, having uh, just things in my life line up has given me some, uh, you know, ability to not be dominated by that all the time. That's so great. I'm not changing. I'm still like that. I'm still lazy, but I'm really productive and lazy. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> I can actually relate to that as well, Nick. I'm uh, predominantly lazy by nature, but I know yeah. – I know the same thing as, uh, you know, I keep my word and I know the, how much work I put in is what I'm going to get out. So, you know, yeah, when yeah. those times where you go to yourself, Oh, I can't be bothered doing that. You're like, I need to do that. That's going to have this result. So I'm going to stretch myself out of that zone. So yeah, that's uh, it's funny hearing that. It sounds like, yeah, exactly like me. It's true. So I have a lot of things that don't get done, you know, that I start a lot of things and, don't finish, but it's okay because I still get a lot done, and I just, you know, whatever. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, just a person like everybody else. I have 
strengths and, and things that aren't helpful and things that I've learned that are powerful and useful and also things that, you know, things that I learned as a kid. There's things that just don't work, like growing up and having tantrums. <laughs> yeah, maybe it worked when you were five. <laughs> But when you're a grown-up, it doesn't work to have tantrums. Yeah, not so much. Yeah, having them in the uh, shopping center, smashing your hands. <laughs> I made this! You said this was on sale, and it's not. <laughs> you might get a good sale out of it, though. <laughs> well, you might, but it's not worth it. No, definitely not. But, uh, Nick, uh, just getting ready to wrap up, I wanted to say thank you so much for being on the show. Um, now, is there any parting advice that you'd give to my audience that could really help them out with their career? Uh, just go buy a copy of The Pathfinder. Exactly. And uh, I was going to recommend that as well because uh, it's an amazing uh, book. How to, what is it? The Pathfinder, How to Choose or Change Your Career for a Lifetime of Satisfaction and Success. And, and you said you weren't good at sales. Jeez, come on. <laughs> uh, you, have to, you have to do that, you know, I guess. You just, but... One sentence. Exactly. It's okay. It's That's another right. thing. You just promote, promote, promote. That was just only five seconds or something. <laughs> exactly. Well, Nick, I wanted to say thank you so much for being on the show. Keep up the amazing work. You're such an inspiration to me, and yeah. you've, you've made such a difference in my business and my life already. Um, and I wanted to welcome you to the Career Breakthrough Tribe. Oh, thank you. And uh, what a joy and, a, and an honor it is to talk with, you, especially somebody, you could be like my brother from a different mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so just finalizing it, Nick, um, so where can people best get in contact with you? I know you said you're redoing your website, but what's the best places to get in touch with you? Best place is Rockport Institute, Rockport Institute, all one word, dot com. Perfect. That's, That's perfect. The that's awesome. Well, uh, Nick, thank like, you. Rock, 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 poor, 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 institute, institute. Dot com, com, com. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, thank you so much, Nick. I've, I've really appreciated your time. It's incredible. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work and helping you change right. people's lives. You too. you too. Thanks again, Nick. Have a great night. Thank you very much. See you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Career Breakthrough Series. If you guys have loved the amazing content that Nick's delivered, be sure to get hold of his best-selling book, The Pathfinder. To get a copy of your book, head to the link below, which was bit.ly forward slash Rockport Rules, R-O-C-K-P-O-R-T-R-U-L-E-S. Well, guys, if you wanted to get hold of the show notes for today's episode or previous episode, be sure to head to my website, which was at bit.ly forward slash breakthrough podcast, B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Thanks, guys. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Stay tuned next week for another incredible episode.